Greetings, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm honored to be here. I think I have one of the most difficult times to talk because we've just eaten, and after we eat, often we become a little more tired. So it's my job today to keep you engaged in this learning experience with me. So who is Impira? Impira is made up of these four organizations that you see up here on the screen. Presbyterian Homes and Services, Elam Care, St. Therese, and Volunteers of America. They created Impira, the organization that I work for, back in the early 2000s when they realized that they were each working on their own quality improvement initiatives in silos. However, they were working on the same goals. So what they did is they came together as an organization to form what we call Impira today. In fact, these long-term care competitors in the state of Minnesota are known competitors in the long-term care industry. But they came together with the realization that if you want to go far, you need to go together. In fact, we adopted an African proverb that says this, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you must go together. And that's exactly what we've done in our programs. So here's the process. This is how we've done this in our state. In 2008, we applied for and obtained a three-year Minnesota Department of Human Services grant. Initially, our collaborative consisted of 23 skilled nursing facilities. Currently, we now serve 25 skilled nursing facilities within my state and we employ over 6,000 staff members. And it's our job at Impira to educate when it comes to quality improvement. The process was first to educate ourselves as the Impira educational team. The topic, um, often we'd attend um, national conferences and consultation then with subject matter experts. We began by offering site education in our skilled nursing facilities and began implementing to enhance residents' quality of life, facilitated between the Imperial Liaison, myself, and the site interdisciplinary team. Included with that, then, is site collection and compilation of data, where we are accountable, then. If we're going to receive funding from our state, we are accountable to meet quality metrics. So we report, then, those metrics to the state, and if we're successful, which we have been, then we are given that reimbursement. We report then our findings and outcomes to the Minnesota um, Human Services, and we continue sharing and ongoing monitoring and adjustment of our best practices. Sharing includes then, not only within our own state, but nationally in the United States, we share our information. And then now, here I'm sharing with you today. A cornerstone to all of our work and all of our programs is root cause analysis. And Albert Einstein had this to say about root cause analysis. He said, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the solution. That would, I would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes on the solution. And what he's really saying his, here is that we would spend our time up front investigating what was going wrong and the solution would come relatively easy. Here's just a timeline of our work uh, within our state. These are our, our performance pr improvement programs. We started with the Falls program in 2008 to 2011. In our Falls program, near the end of the Falls program, we realized one of the reasons residents in our communities were falling was re related to lack of restorative sleep. So we started our restorative sleep program. And in restorative sleep, we began to realize there was a group of residents that were really difficult to understand when it came to their sleep. And those are residents in later stages of dementia or Alzheimer's. Our work currently is in the RESOLUTE program, and we began that this last year. RESOLUTE stands for Resident Empowered Solutions on Living Till the End, with the realization that when residents were coming into our care communities, we often had them for about 2.2 years before the time that they pass. 
Residents often have a lot of work yet to do, which we term the work of aging. And it's up to us, then, to help them with that work. So I'm here today to talk to you about restorative sleep and the importance of restorative sleep. Restorative sleep is defined here as one continuous significant sleep period in a 24-hour day, ideally lasting anywhere between seven to nine hours. That's what an average adult needs, seven to nine hours, and it occurs at night. As humans, we were created to be diurnal, which means that we sleep when the moon is out, so as the sun goes down, we need to sleep, and we wake then when the sun comes out. That's just how our bodies were created. So why is restorative sleep important? Restorative sleep is important because it is the restart of our bodies, and it's the only time that we have true physical restoration and true psychosocial and emotional healing. We need sleep for our overall health and well-being. Here's what happens when we have restorative sleep. When we have restorative sleep, our memories are cemented, especially our short-term memories. We process our emotions, and our stress is relieved. The impact on the body is that we have cell and tissue repair and regeneration that happens in this stage of sleep. We have cellular growth. We have hormone regulation. Growth hormones are created and released when we're in sleep. And our immunity is built. T4 cells, B cells, cancer-fighting cells are created and released in the deepest stages of sleep. So how do we sleep and how do we wake? We sleep and we wake based on what's known as our circadian rhythm or our biological clock, and what's known as sleep-wake homeostasis. I'll start with melatonin, okay? So melatonin drives our bodies for sleep at night. If I were to dissect my brain into quarters, in the center of my brain you would find what's known as my pineal gland. The pineal gland is shaped like a pine cone. This pineal gland creates and releases melatonin in the presence of darkness, ultimately driving my body for sleep at night. The other piece that we have that drives our bodies for sleep is what's known as adenosine, okay? Adenosine is created when we're very, very active throughout the day. And the busier and more active we are for the day, the more drive we have for sleep at night. Very powerful. And adenosine is actually a hormone, but it acts as a neurotransmitter, driving our bodies for sleep. How do we wake? Well, we wake by exposure to sunlight or any type of light. We're exposed to good, bright white light. Our body will start producing what's known as serotonin. Serotonin is also known as the happy feel-good hormone. It drives our bodies for wake. The other piece that drives our bodies for wake is what's known as cortisol. Cortisol, your body ad automatically will start producing this at about 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning. It'll drive your body for wake. Let's take a look here at the sleep cycles and stages. Okay? This is an average adult and what their sleep cycles and stages should look like. On average, we should have four to five cycles per night. Four to five cycles per night, each of those cycles lasting anywhere from 90 to 120 minutes, okay? We also sleep then in what's known as stages, starting with stage one, stage two, stage three, and REM sleep, otherwise known as rapid eye movement, or some refer to it as dream stage. But in stage one sleep, this typically lasts about anywhere from seven to eight minutes, maybe even up to 15 minutes. But this is the stage of sleep when I initially go to bed for the night. My heart rate starts to drop. My blood pressure starts to drop. This is the stage of sleep that if you've ever woken up and felt like you've had this tonic jerk, felt like you're falling off of a cliff or falling down the stairs, you're in stage one sleep. Stage two sleep. In stage two sleep, our brain decides if I'm gonna save, file, or trash my learnings from the day. 
save, file, or trash my learnings from the day. So I tell you while you're at this conference, every night hit save. Save. You want to remember these learnings, okay? The other piece that happens in stage two sleep is our heart rate continues to drop still, our blood pressure continues to drop, our brain activity starts to slow a little bit, and we're driving our bodies then for deeper restorative sleep. Then we come to stage three, stage three sleep. In stage three sleep, this is what I refer to as the omega of all sleep. As a nurse, this is where I know the body healing is going to happen. The majority of body healing, wound healing, happens in stage three sleep. Okay? In stage three sleep, that's when those cancer-fighting cells are created and released. That's when cell tissue repair and regeneration happens. It's powerful. So, so powerful. This is the stage of sleep if you've ever known somebody to be placed into a medically induced coma. The physician is looking to get them into stage three sleep because they know that's where the body healing is going to happen. Our body then goes into what's known as REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And in rapid eye movement, this is where we have the majority of the mind healing that happens. Your mind is healing. You're dealing with your emotions and your stressors from the day. That's about the only time that this happens. Now, Florence Nightingale, the founder of Modern Nursing, said this. She said, it is our responsibility to put the patient in the best condition possible for nature to act upon them. It is our job as care providers, as professionals, to put people in the best condition possible. In fact, it's one of the best things we can do is by giving them restorative sleep. That puts them in the best condition possible. We can't stop the aging process, not yet anyway, but we certainly can address sleep. Here is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you look close, when you look at the physiological needs of patients, of residents, he included sleep as being foundational in his hierarchy of needs for people to obtain this they should have this so that they can climb and get up this hierarchy of needs to eventually self-actualization. Is, sleep is just as important as breathing, food, water, shelter, and clothing. So now let's take a look at this. So we went through this just minutes ago. This is our sleep and wake cycles here. Okay. Now think about the practices in long-term care that inhibit restorative sleep from happening. Think about rounding practices. Every two-hour rounding practices in our communities. It interrupts possibly body healing in stage three sleep or mental health sleep or mental health. Think about rounding practices. Think about water passes. Think about nighttime cares and routines that wake people, that inhibit them from getting restorative sleep. And the thing about this is if they're woken by us as staff, they don't get to fall back to sleep where they left off. We have to start this all over again. They go back to stage one. And that's where they spend their nights then, early on in this healing. And if you look at this diagram too, you can see that most of our body healing happens in the first part of the night. Most of our mental health healing happens later on, as the night goes on. And if we're preventing people from getting that mental health healing, we're doing a disservice. In our program, when we first started out, we thought we were causing sleep deprivation for our residents. In fact, we were causing what's known as sleep fragmentation. Sleep fragmentation is defined as sleep that is interrupted through the night, inhibiting the opportunity for restorative sleep that is required for overall health and well-being. That's what we were causing. And I'm sure some of you have probably suffered fragmented sleep as well. If you've ever been a new parent, gotten up with your newborn during the night, you've suffered maybe from what's known as parent fog, okay? Or if you've been hospitalized, 
If you've ever been hospitalized, you often want to be discharged so you can go home and do what? Sleep? Very well, could be. Here's the outcomes of poor sleep. So we know that there's an impact on the mind and there's impact on the body. The impact on the mind includes memory impairment, depression, anxiety, delusions, paranoia, hallucinations, and disorganized speech. Let's look at the impact on the body. People are more apt to have poor balance and poor strength. They're much more accident prone. Falls. This is where we come to falls. They have impaired immunity. More often have heart disease. They have several hormonal changes that happen. They're at higher risk for cancer. They have increased pain sensitivity, often run higher blood pressures. Obesity, impaired growth and healing. If you recall when I was talking about those stages of sleep, the impaired growth and healing, that's stage three sleep. As a nurse now, when we look at this diagram, these are all things I've care planned for residents. Every single one of these things I've care planned for residents, including falls, pressure ulcers, antipsychotic medications, behavioral expressions, depression, anxiety. All of these things, all of these problems, all of these diagnoses can sometimes be the result of fragmented sleep. Let's take a look here at our programs again. We had this reality at the organization I work for then, that if we were to start equality in initiatives over, we would have very likely started with restorative sleep before falls because we knew the impact after we did our sleep program. The impact on our falls rates, our falls went drastically down. We started out in our falls program with the average fall for residents being 16 per 1,000 resident days. And after our sleep program, we got down to four falls per 1,000 resident days. Dramatic. We're gonna take a look here. So what did we do about this problem? Well, we started doing some research. And in our work, we look at research and then we apply it in our 25 organizations. Again, I often refer to them as test kitchens in a sense. And if we know that we can be successful there, then we know that we can go out and speak about it and share our learnings, okay? So this is a study from the Harvard Medical School that was done in 2010. Now realize we started our sleep program in 2011. And in this study, the Harvard Medical School took a look at the top 10 sleep disturbances in congregate living situations, long-term care, hospitals, and this is what they said, number one, sleep disturbance is noise. And noise, the word noise actually comes from a Latin derivative of nausea, okay? Noise is number one. Second is light. Third, sleeping environment. Four, napping. Five, medications. Six, continence needs. Seven, pain. Eight, positioning. Nine, activity and inactivity. And 10, being diet. I'm gonna tell you what we did. I'm gonna tell you what the problem was and I'm gonna tell you what our solutions or our interventions were. So when we looked at noise, what was reported to us then through this study and then also with the residents in our care communities is that the top disruptors for them to get restorative sleep were staff conversations and loud personal alarms. So we addressed those staff conversations, encouraged people to quiet down when they're coming in for shift. Not congregate near time clocks or a hallway. Take their conversation somewhere else. We audited and monitored sound levels throughout our buildings. If you have a smartphone and you look on Google app, the Google App Store, you've got a free decibel reading in your phone. You can use that as a tool, okay? To accommodate good restorative sleep, you need decibel readings anywhere between 30 to 40 decibels, if not less. And to give you a little perspective on decibel readings, 60 is normal conversation. So we audited. 
We reduce noisy times, including those shift change times, meals and rounding. We eliminated personal alarms altogether. We had started eliminating personal alarm use back with our falls program. And we identified then our loud speaking staff and we addressed them personally. So second is light. The problem in our, in our communities, we knew that residents were not getting a good enough exposure to um, good bright white light during the day and they were getting exposed to too much light than at night. Okay? Think back to what I told you about what drives our bodies for sleep and wake. It's light exposure. It's light exposure. So we need to know what type of light exposures our residents are getting. What did we do about it? We put our hallway lights on timers. Common areas on timers. Take out human air by putting things on timers. Lights go down at 8 p.m. and they come on at 8 a.m. We also uh, implemented what's known as circadian rhythm lighting that would help people stay awake and engaged during the day, but it would go down in the evening so their melatonin levels could come up and drive their bodies for sleep. In the state of Minnesota where I'm from, we have winter six months out of the year. We don't have a lot of sunlight. And so these were very important for us to have. Our staff members at night, they wore what's known as hug lights that look like a stethoscope that goes around their necks. And on the very end, it's amber film. So the light is amber because amber will not disrupt melatonin production where bright white or blue light will. We utilize pathway motion detectors. One of the biggest practices we did is we encouraged resident activities to be held outside. Get exposure to that good serotonin, that vitamin D. And encouraging staff members to open blinds. Third problem in this study then was looking at the sleeping environment. Residents would often say that they were on uncomfortable sleeping surfaces, and that included mattresses, pillows, blankets, their own pajamas. And our solutions there were to take a look at what mattresses we were using. Going to static pressure redistribution mattresses, dating our mattresses, because we understood then that all mattresses typically have a shelf life, and we should be looking at those expiration dates. We encourage residents to bring their own pillows from home and also had a closet full of soft, medium, or firm pillows for them to utilize. Also, if they'd like a full body pillow, maybe they came from home where they were sleeping next to their partner, their husband, and they wanted the comfort of somebody laying next to them, we could do that with full body pillows. Let's look at daytime napping. Do you have anybody that naps in your communities? Yeah? Too much napping during the day can impair our sleep and our wake cycle. So we began by educating staff, residents, and family members. Ideally, a nap should last no longer than 30 minutes, one time per day, if at all. In fact, NASA took a look at this with their military pilots and their astronauts and they got it down to 26 minutes. Anything longer than 26 minutes will disrupt somebody's sleep at night. Medications. What did we do as far as medications go? We know that medications oftentimes can cause insomnia, sleepiness. They're a common side effect of many of the medications our seniors are on. Another problem is the timing of medications. So we began to align medications with your biological and circadian rhythm and help support that sleep and wake cycle. The other process utilized then was what's known as liberalized medication passes, where nurses had a window of time to administer medications instead of the stringent one hour where they would go in and wake people up. Continence needs. This is a big one for our communities. We realize that as you age, you often need to use the bathroom maybe a little bit more. Our bladders don't hold as much as they did in our younger years. Our sphincter on our bladder may not be as strong as it used to be. So we need to get up and use the bathroom. 
residents awakened by staff then every um, two hours for what we call the traditional checks and changes, which we know no longer is valid. And the timing of laxatives, stool softeners, foods, and fluids all impact our continence needs. So our solutions and our interventions there were to bulk people's fluids earlier in the day and taper them as the day goes on. Bulk them early in the day, taper them as the day goes on. And the use of an overnight incontinent product. Now, when we talked about introducing overnight incontinent products to our administrators, our directors of nursing, first thing that came to mind was budget. You're going to blow the budget. In reality, we did a cost analysis for all of our communities, and it was much cheaper for them to go to the overnight incontinent products. One being they're not doing multiple changes during the night. Second, that takes staff time, on average about 15 minutes to change residents. The other piece with that is we weren't disrupting their restorative sleep, and that's the most impactful piece of it. Pain, okay? We know that pain can cause discomfort and restlessness to people during the night, and it can often wake people. Um, as we age, we have an increased pain sensitivity. Our solutions and our interventions include, included identifying what the root cause of the pain was. Is it emotional pain or is it physical pain? And then align the interventions accordingly. We use long-acting pain medications given at bedtime so we're not disturbing somebody during the night. Schedule as-needed pain medications. Make them routine. And looking into non-pharmacological interventions, massage, aromatherapy, warm blankets, any way to help with pain. Positioning. The problem in long-term care is we were repositioning people far too often than they needed. Okay? Standard of practice used to be that every two hours as a nurse, I would round on somebody. I would go into the room, wake them up, or try to be real discreet, change them real quick and sneak out of the room. Chances are I was waking them up. The solutions or the interventions are to assess skin conditions for tolerating longer periods of time. Look at your tissue tolerance tests, your Braden scales. They're there for a purpose. Our mattresses are far better off than they were years ago. Try to expend, extend those periods of uninterrupted sleep from two hours to three and three to four four to five, and your goal being that seven to nine. We also looked at activity and inactivity. Problem, residents were often falling asleep because they were bored. They were bored. There was a lack of engagement and a lack of purpose. And we know that some residents often will fall asleep if they have a functional limitation that prevents them from attending some type of an activity. So our solution and our interventions included interview the residents. What would keep you awake? What would keep you awake? What would you like to do? If we can recognize that our human body is like a rechargeable battery, and if you look on the back of a battery pack, it, it will read that in order to get the best charge, the body needs to fully exhaust itself. It's the same with our bodies. Lastly, it was diet. The problem with diet is that food and fluid intake directly affects our elimination status, so that will wake us. And spicy foods, caffeine and sugar can disturb sleep. Solutions and interventions there would be, we need to align foods and fluids with our circadian rhythm. Okay? We looked at what foods and fluids out there could help drive our bodies for sleep at night. A banana is a good snack at night. Bananas contain melatonin, and they contain potassium. And potassium is a natural cardiac relaxant. It will help you sleep at night. Uh, we also looked then at tart cherry juice, given at HS, will help your body sleep at night because of its contents of melatonin. Wake foods, any foods high in vitamin C, will help you stay awake. Caffeine, of course will help you stay awake. So what did we do? One, we provided sleep education to the staff, 
to the residents, to the residents' families, to care providers, to our local surveyors, our state surveyors, and our federal government. We took them along with us on this learning. Again, we interviewed residents. We utilized actigraphy to assess and identify individualized sleep concerns, and an IDT approach, interdisciplinary team approach, and root cause analysis. We began care plans then that looked at daytime and nighttime care plans. Not just one consolidated care plan, but one that specifically looks at what it looks like for me during the day and what it looks like for me at night. We audited day and nighttime practices, and we continue to monitor for sustainment. And I want to leave you with this. Maya Angelou said this. I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. And I encourage you here today and in your learnings, now that you know better, it is your turn to do better. Here is our social media slide if you want to connect with us. Uh, we have a table too just outside the conference center on the lower level. If you want more information on our sleep program, there is a DVD there for purchase. Thank you.